I appreciate each one of them being here uh, today, and you're really in for a treat to be able to interact with them and hear all about the ministries, all that's going on. If you're brand new with us, my name is John. I'm a lead pastor here at the Arbor. It's just good uh, to be with you today. I want to just ha- say thank you uh, from uh, Jill and myself and the family just for your welcome. I mean, we really have had a wonderful welcome in the last uh, couple of weeks. You've just been so gracious with your words and your gifts, and, and we really can't thank every one of you individually, and so we just thank you. We really do feel welcome and a part uh, of the church, and we're just so excited uh, to be here uh, with you. I want to let you know that I actually planned on preaching this message a couple of weeks from now. Uh, this message um, is a little bit of a, uh, a meddling message. <laughs> In fact, a few weeks ago, if you remember, Bishop uh, Roller spoke, uh, and uh, in the message he said something like, I-, I know I've gone from preaching to meddling. And my daughter Jenna was here that day, and later on she said, you know, I really appreciated that, that he recognized when he went from preaching to meddling, because, Dad, you don't know that. <laughs> and so I-, I-, I admit that this message... Um, it actually uh, would be a little bit better after you get to know us a little bit more, um, but uh, because of the ministry fair, it just seems to really fit. And so would you just uh, open your heart in prayer with me because we want to hear from what the Spirit has to say today. Let's, let's pray. Spirit of God, we just set aside ourselves. We thank you for your gentle and yet persistent hand in our lives, and so we offer ourselves to you today. We look forward to what you're going to say. Uh, Spirit, have your way in every way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So if you were to travel with me to southeastern Missouri in the boot hill just above the Ozarks, where all of my family is actually from until Dad got a job at General Motors in Flint, you'd run into all kinds of lane cousins and carrier cousins. That's the two sides of my family, carriers uh, and lanes. And if, and if they asked you, how do you know John Robb, <laughs> you may not recognize who that is. I'm John Robb. It was my nickname for most of my life growing up uh, in Michigan when we go to southeastern Missouri. They'd call me John Robb. I'd come back here. I'd be known as John. My mother's dad's name is John. My dad's dad's name was Robert, and so I'm a John Robert, which is a John Rob. Jesse's a Jesse Robert. We pass it along. Isn't it funny nicknames, how they just kind of persist in our lives? In fact, I find it interesting that many uh, famous people have nicknames that we call them by. So let me just give you a quiz of some athletes or celebrities and, and see if you can kind of name what their nickname is. So if you remember in football, William Perry, the fridge, that's right. How about Dennis Rodman, the worm, good. Carl Malone, the mailman, how about LeBron? King. Isn't that funny? The chosen one. Remember the baseball player Frank Thomas? The Big Hurt. I like that one. You can call me the Big Hurt, all right? <laughs> Let's go back a little ways. Frank Sinatra, chairman of the board or old blue eyes. Michael Jackson, the king of pop. Aretha Franklin, the queen of soul. Taylor Swift's boyfriend. The Big Yeti, that's what he's known. How about Shaquille O'Neal? Shaq or Shaq Fu or the Big Daddy or Superman or the Big Agave or the Big Cactus or the Big Galactus or the Big Shactus or the Big Shamrock or the Big Leprechaun and my favorite, Wilt Chamberneasy. (laughs) It's fascinating to think about the reasons behind nicknames because usually you ended up with a nickname because of something you did or some characteristic about your life. So John Wesley's followers were called Methodist or Wesleyans, Methodists, because we like to do things in a fairly methodical or practical way. In fact, I was in Bangladesh several years ago. I was training our pastors as to what it means to be a free Methodist in a Bangladeshi system, and I had a pastor raise his hand, and he said, you know, I understand that free part. I get freedom. He said, but what is a Methodist? 
I'm like, all right, this is not going to be easy to try to explain. As I mentioned last week, followers of Jesus, our nicknames right at the beginning were followers of the way. Followers of the way. So all throughout this series, it's about the way of Jesus. But did you know that Jesus had a nickname? Do you know that Jesus had something that started as a slur, but then he embraced, in fact, he embraced it before that. They called Jesus a friend of sinners. And some of us should say, thank the Lord. <laughs> in fact, all of us. Here's the whole quote from Matthew chapter 11, verse 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, here's a glutton and a drunkard, two other nicknames for him, a friend of tax collectors and a friend of sinners. But Jesus pointed to the scoreboard, and he said, wisdom is proved right by her deeds. We could spend a lot of time today just talking about why Jesus was called a glutton and a drunkard, and some of you would want me to preach that sermon, but that's not what I'm going to spend time on today. I'm going to spend time on why Jesus was called a friend of sinners. Why was he called a friend of tax collectors? I mean, out of all of the many ways of Jesus that caused the religious elite to hate him during his day, it was with whom he associated with that drove them the most crazy. How he willingly placed himself in situations with people that seemed far from God or the wrong kind of people. He welcomed the wrong kind of people. He ate with the wrong kind of people. He touched the wrong kind of people. He allowed himself to be touched by the wrong kind of people. And in the eyes of the religious elite, Jesus' life was dishonoring to God because he spent time with sinners. In their view, their religiously twisted view, Jesus was not honoring to God because of with whom he ate. Ironically, in the eyes of God, in the eyes of Jesus, it was with whom he ate that showed who he was. You see, we are rescued from darkness and we run to darkness to rescue others. This is the way to boldly go. I promise you, I'm not going to have a sci-fi illustration every week, but I, I can't say that it's not going to be at least once a month. <laughs> the way of Jesus is to boldly go where no one else is going. There are so many places in Scripture that I could go to show you the compassionate hospitality of our Lord Jesus to people who are far from God, the healing presence of Jesus, and the early church and the lives of the broken, including the list of miscreants and ragamuffins that he called apostles, who he chose and said, come with me and follow me. I landed on Matthew chapter 9. And in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus has just been accused of blasphemy because he's told a paralyzed man his sins are forgiven. The Pharisees said, and teachers of the law object, they said, only God alone has the power to forgive sin. And I think Jesus just nodded. <laughs> That's right. And then he heals the paralyzed man. And to emphasize, he indeed has the power not only to heal but to forgive sins. And then we have this account, Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. It says this, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew, the, the very author of the book we're reading right now, sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed Jesus. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. 
For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This quote, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, it's from the book of Hosea, and I don't want to talk about it now, I want to talk about it later, so don't let me forget, okay? We're going to come back to that. But first, Jesus and Matthew, the newly called scoundrel apostle having dinner with Jesus at his house, at, at Matthew's house. The very food that day would have been paid for likely by the funds that Matthew had stolen or overcharged his fellow Jewish people. They would have lounged at the table. It's, it's great to picture in your mind. A table filled with bread and cheeses and, uh, and olive oil and olives and figs and melons and pomegranates and dates. It would seem more like snacking to us, but that's often how they ate, just these little pieces here and there. There'd be people that would be coming and going all throughout the meal for the houses were open and, and connected and people would come in and, and they would go out. So Matthew's friends, perhaps who are, are used to stopping in that night because he had perhaps the best food from all the money that he took from his fellow Jewish people, or they heard that that Matthew was hosting this local rabbi named Jesus, they would have stopped in and taken their place at the table. Or they would have stood on the outskirts of the room just kind of listening in as Matthew served meat, most likely, even though that wasn't a normal occasion. But on festivals or whenever you have a special guest, surely Matthew had meat that night. And there's conversations, and if you can imagine uh, people that normally aren't around the synagogue, they're not around uh, religious rabbi types, they get to ask questions that they normally don't get to ask because the synagogue wouldn't allow for these kinds of questions where someone could just raise their hand and say, Rabbi, why do you think this happened in my life? Or, or what does this mean? Why, why are we treated this way, perhaps, by the religious elite? But picture this meal through the eyes of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law. They would have heard this buzz coming from Matthew's house, and they would have thought, ah, there he goes again, <laughs> another worldly party. They get word, though, do you know who's at this one? That, that teacher, that, that rabbi, Jesus is there. Oh, what a drunkard. What a glutton scandalous. How can Jesus approve of these people and their lifestyle? Doesn't he know that his very presence approves of their life? And that's what I was taught growing up in the church. I was warned that my very presence with certain people would somehow approve of their lifestyle, and so we didn't want to associate with certain groups or in certain places because we didn't want to somehow be seen as, as giving approval. And dare I say, it seems more like the way of the religious church than the way of Jesus. I told you I was going to meddle. Jesus had the right and the power to turn down Matthew's invitation because it would have looked bad. He could have said no. He surely knew who was going to be there that night. He surely knew the interconnection of the tax collectors and sinners and this whole group. He could have said, you know, I, I think I'll pass on this. And I'm fully convinced some of the disciples tried to convince him to not go. But he didn't. And thank the Lord. Because he also ate with you. And all the people that said to someone, don't associate with that person, someone didn't listen. And they came and loved you and told you about a father that's not scandalized by your life, but who gave himself for it. It seems something about Jesus drew people to him that the Pharisees felt were the wrong kind of people, the problem people. And while there are some direct parallels in how we can apply this today with our assumptions about poor people or those in poverty or the wrong kind of people, 
I want you to remember, just ratchet this up a little bit. This was a religious culture. This is a culture that was, is more like Saudi Arabia than it is Detroit or Jackson. So when we say Jesus ate with the wrong kind of people, we need to know that there were stonings and public killings and family shunnings if you didn't fall in line. And Jesus decided to eat with the wrong kind of people. This was a choice, and not just a choice in ministering to these people, it was a statement about the way of Jesus, that this is what the followers of Jesus do. It wasn't virtue signaling. It wasn't like some TikTok star showing up to the shelter and having their picture taken. Jesus naturally pursues broken people, regardless of the cost. And then He taught us to do it as well because He understood something about what holiness and righteousness is, is about. For many of us, as we were growing up, we were taught that holiness and purity and righteousness is a primarily about where you don't go and what you don't do. And Jesus turned it all on its head to show us that true holiness and righteousness, right living, if you will, is about with whom you decide to eat and actually where you spend your time. You may or may not know the name Miriam Swanson. She's just an amazing teacher, amazing preacher. She, she joined the, what's called the holiness movement, you know, the Nazarenes, Free Methodists, Wesleyans, this whole kind of group. She joined us later, just a five years ago. In fact, she even said from up front once, she said, I didn't know you all existed. I didn't, do you know this word holiness? Do you know what it actually means? She said that holiness and purity is like bleach. Bleach doesn't do any good in the bottle. The purpose of bleach is to be poured out where it's needed most, that that's holiness, that that's purity, that that's righteousness, that the way of Jesus is to infuse hope in human suffering, even if we don't know what the practical answer is for people, to infuse hope into human suffering and then call His followers to do the same. This is the way. <laughs> Matthew chapter 9, later on, we have these words. Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he thought, oh, another long line. <laughs> now, this is what he said. When he saw the crowds, he, he had compassion on them. They were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, look at these people. A harvest, it's plentiful. But people that get it, it's few people that get this. So ask the Lord of the harvest, send out workers into this harassed and helpless harvest field. I'll tell you, this is a growing edge for me. It is. At the end of this last year, I was at one of our churches uh, in Indianapolis, and they do this practice of handing out a word for the year connected to an ornament, and then it may be the word that you want to choose for your life for the next year. So I'm hanging out afterwards. I didn't get a, an ornament, and so I got handed an ornament, and on it, it just simply says compassion. Compassion. And I have been wrestling then with my own heart, which at times just becomes hardened because of the pain and the thorns of life around us. Situations that seem almost impossible to find an answer for, compassion is what Jesus seems to be calling me to. I mean, see, Jesus saw people. He felt pain for them. He, he enacted this phrase that he had compassion on the crowd. It doesn't do the original language justice. The original phrase here means that Jesus hurt in the inmost part of his guts. He felt it in his belly. He felt his inwards moved by compassion. And I avoid that. I don't like that feeling. 
I turn the channel when I hear, in the arms of the angels. I'm like, I don't want to see any other dog suffering. I'm going to… Here's the most remarkable thing. In all of the Gospels, this phrase of being moved in the inner parts of our being, our gut, it's, it's, almost, it's used almost exclusively of Jesus in the Gospels. Like He got it and we don't. And when you understand that Jesus is the exact representation of God the Father, it goes even deeper. It means that the deepest feelings of mercy for people are felt within God Himself. It is mercy that draws us to Him, not rules. Where you and I look at a crowd of people and we generally see a headache for ourselves, whether it's a line or traffic or some people group, Jesus feels deeply within Himself compassion for people, and then He says, go do likewise. The way of Jesus is to infuse hope in human suffering, and He calls His followers to do the same. And this is perhaps why He quotes Hosea, so thank you for reminding me, because I wanted to come back to this. I I don't know if you know that Jesus maybe had a a favorite verse. (laughs) He quotes this verse from Hosea at least twice. Here's the quote from the New Testament, quoting the Old. On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but it's the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And it comes from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. The full quote is this, I desire mercy, this is the Father saying this, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, the acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Jesus quotes it a second time in Matthew chapter 12, verse 7. He says, if you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. In this section, the Pharisees are angry with Jesus because His disciples were hungry on the Sabbath, and they went around and they were knocking off the heads off of the wheat, and they would grind them in their hands, and they would eat these little pieces of grain And the the Pharisees said, don't you know that this is a Sabbath? You shouldn't be doing that. That's not being careful. Don't you know how mad God will be if we're not paying attention to not do these kind of things? It's scandalous. It's work. And Jesus said, hey, have you read in Hosea where it says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice? I mean, what's going on here? Here's my best shot. This is what I think is going on. There's a way of doing spirituality or religion that seems spiritual, but it's actually detrimental to true spirituality. There's a way of doing it, and and you really only seem to get trapped in this if you are a part of religious institutions. In Hosea's day, People were mistreating one another. They were worshiping other gods throughout the week. Their hearts were far away from God, but they were still coming to church. They were still bringing their sacrifices to the synagogues, to the temple. And they were being very careful and precise about their sacrifices. For all throughout the law, we are taught that all the sacrifices need to be pure without any defect of a certain kind of animal, and they were being very careful to make sure they were doing all of that right and then not caring how they were treating each other. I mean, sometimes it's just easier to be religious than it is to be in a relationship with God. Check the boxes of whatever boxes those are. But for when we are careful in our religion, we know the rules. And they are generally a bunch of don'ts. (laughs) Don't associate with a particular kind of people. Keep yourself separate from them. Show up to worship service, even volunteer, and be very careful how you live your life. But Jesus is here saying mercy is more important than being careful. And this is not natural for us. 
Compassion and love and mercy is more desired by God than anything we can give Him as a payoff for His love. The way of Jesus is a more narrow pathway, He says. Not because the rules are more strict. We mistaught that for so long. The way of Jesus is narrow because it is foundationally a relationship of love, not a rule list to follow. And when you get close to the heart of God, you feel his compassion for all people. And then you too, like hot coals burning together, lean into compassion for all people too. It is far easier to be careful in our religion and compassion in our practice. Let me give you another illustration of of how this kind of worked itself out in the early church. Saul is persecuting the church. Jesus confronts him. He becomes Paul. He, he is, he's a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knows all the careful rules. Jesus confronts him. He gives his life to him. His eyes are opened. And then he goes and he starts preaching the gospel, and he preaches to Jewish people, and he preaches to Gentile people, and he preaches a very simple message that Jesus took our sin that we would not have to pay for it. That all of the things that we could try to do to try to meet God's demands, what seemed like God's demand, Jesus did for us. So it is by faith, it's grace. We say yes, we receive him, we receive the Spirit, and then we walk in newness. Paul starts to get a little bit worried. We don't exactly know what is going on, but it's 14 years after this encounter. We hear about this in the book of Galatians. There are some people that come from Jerusalem who were called Judaizers that began kind of pushing Paul, saying, you know what, you need to tell all of these Gentiles that they need to get circumcised, they need to show up to the temple, they need to obey all the food laws, they need to do all the stuff that the Jewish people couldn't do. They need to do all these rules, and so Paul calls a meeting. He gets a hold of John and Peter, and he gets a hold of James and the apostles in Jerusalem. He says, can we meet? And he travels to Jerusalem, and he lays out for them the gospel he's been preaching. This is what I've been saying. Jews don't need to become Gentiles. Gentiles don't need to become Jews. Those are cultural things. What matters is following Jesus, being filled with the Spirit, and walking in newness. That's what matters. And John and Peter and James said, that's it. That's the gospel. But I want you to hear they added something else that's not actually an addition, it's a result. Galatians chapter 2, verse 9 through 10, it says this. James and Cephas, or Peter and John, those esteemed as pillars, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me, and they agreed You get it right. You go to the Gentiles. We'll continue to go to the circumcised, to the Jewish people. But all they asked, all they asked was that we would continue to remember the poor. The very thing, Paul says, that I was eager to do all along. Don't miss this. They have this meeting of the apostles, and, and, and they're wrestling about what is the gospel and, and what is it that we're proclaiming to a religious world and a non-religious world? What is it that Jesus did for us? Oh, by the way, he taught us to love the poor. Don't forget it. And Paul says, why would I ever forget it? <laughs> We jumped 2,000 years, and I could say, I can tell you why we'd forget it. Remember the poor. This is the apostolic teaching, folks. In a, in a day, decades ago, I could say, Thus saith the Bible. <laughs> Remember the poor. Paul's response is, yeah, why would I forget him? We tend to see ministry to the poor as an add-on to the gospel. 
as in preach the gospel, and if you have time, remember the poor. When the apostles themselves, closest to the way of Jesus, said, absolutely it's connected. The free Methodist church was built on two pillars, holiness of heart and life that is to be poured out in this world and ministry to the poor and with the poor. That's our heritage. This word poor in the original language, it means those reduced to begging, asking for alms, who were destitute of wealth, influence, or position, or honor, the lowly, the helpless, the afflicted, the powerless. It literally means the crushed ones in this world, those who have been beaten down by life. And that can be financially, it can be relationally, it can be spiritually, it it can be all sorts of things. But I'll tell you, what a promise. Remember the crushed ones. And some of us are like, thank goodness, because I was crushed. And I heard, you're not forgotten. The gospel is for you. (laughs) You are raised up. I mean, let's be honest, though. Talking about the poor and the impoverished and the crushed ones in this world, it gets political. It gets complicated. I mean, we have that verse in 2 Thessalonians that says, if a person won't work, they they shouldn't eat. And so we wrestle with this, who's the deserving poor and who's the undeserving poor and, and how do we work with them and all of that kind of stuff. I can tell you that my temptation is not to be overly compassionate. And it's not as if God says, John, you're being too nice. You're being way more merciful than I'd ever be. He never has said that to me in my whole life. It's usually like, wow, you really let your heart become hardened on that one. I'm like, yeah, but did you see what they were going to do with that money I gave them? He's like, well, I gave you. Why don't you give to them? N.T. Wright had these words. N.T. Wright's a great theologian. He's a wonderful guy, uh, I think. I've never met him. But, uh, actually, yeah, he's probably watching now. <laughs> this is what he wrote. This is powerful, and then we're going to land the plane. The line between deserving poor and undeserving poor is a very, very hard line to draw. And one of the things about poverty, whether one has work or not, some jobs pay so little that the people who do them are still well within the poverty trap, is that it's depressing. Poverty is depressing. And it actually saps the energy and the nerve and the vitality in ways that people like me, who have never been out of work and never been truly poor, can only appreciate by being with and ministering to people who are generally and chronically poor. I really used to think that poor people just didn't work hard enough until I, until I started to be with them and realized, well, they work way harder than me. I don't have the energy to not be rich There's a real danger that is in in a go-getting country like the USA, those who have initiative, energy, and advantages of birth and education can easily look down on those who have none of these things. It simply isn't the case that every human starts at the same level point so that the rich are those who've worked for it and the poor are those who couldn't be bothered. Throughout the Bible, God seems to take special note of those trapped in poverty And we should do the same. It's the way of Jesus. Remember the poor. Now, I'll be honest, it is a little bit heavy-handed that we have a ministry fair outside of the... (laughs) But I'll tell you, it just seems to fit. We don't want this to be shame-filled or guilt-filled. We want to, you know, many of us, we really just don't even know what to do. Like, we want to know how to help people. We want to know how to give relief. We want to know how to give development. We want to know how to give reform. And and it's very hard to know actually what to do. So we have many opportunities out there for you. One that I just want to highlight is um, our fostering hope. There's all kinds of things that you you can go look at out there in our our ministry hall. I mean, even our FM financial, when you're, if you're wrestling with, well, how do I use my money in a way that makes a significant impact in this world? That's a great question. But on March 17th, Fostering Hope 
we're going to have a gathering for people that may be interested in being a foster parent. And really, according to James, true religion is ministry to the fatherless and to the widow, that that's the result of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You may not know this, but there's a way to do, get involved in foster parenting and foster helping that's not simply taking a child into your home. Many foster parents actually cannot leave uh, the state with that child because of laws about taking kids across state lines. And so if they're going to go visit family in another state, they need someone else to watch that foster child. And so it's a way to dip your toe in, so to speak, into the care for foster children, children in the system. And so on March 17th, we're just going to have an introductory meeting, and you don't have to sign up, for, uh, to sign up once you've been in it, but if you're interested and the Lord sparks your heart, see Matt out there, see the table out there, because fostering hope's a great possibility. Did your phone ring this morning about 2 a.m.? There's an Amber Alert. And in Detroit, there was a little girl that was, that was in the back of a car, her parents' car, and someone stole that car, a little three-year-old girl, and an Amber Alert went out, and my phone went off, 2 a.m., and I'm like, oh, who's texting me, you know? And then I look, and immediately I thought of this message. What do you think the mother was thinking at 2 a.m.? I don't care if you're asleep, get up and pray or look for my kid. Now, praise the Lord, she was found this morning. They found her and she was returned. But what did the father think at 2 a.m.? What did the father think if, if, if she were still missing today, where would the heart of Jesus be? I want you just to listen to the song that Janae is going to sing and, and just listen to the Spirit, what he might say to you. And then I'll wrap us up in prayer.